In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear friends in Christ, thank you for joining me once again. Today we shall reflect on our readings for Pentecost Sunday, Year C. The Feast of Pentecost is one that is older than Christianity itself. The origin of this feast can be traced back to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15 to 16, where we find Moses instructing the people of Israel to count 50 days after the Sabbath as a day that they will present to God their cereal offerings and their new grains. The Feast of Pentecost is one that usually attracted Jews from all over the world to the city of Jerusalem. In fact, Feast of Pentecost is among the three important feasts that every devout Jew was expected to make a pilgrimage to the city of Jerusalem. It was on this day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit decided to come upon the apostles and in fact give birth to the church. So when we Christians celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, we do not celebrate it as a Jewish feast, rather we celebrate it as the Feast of the Holy Spirit and the Feast of the Birth of the Church. Just as a baby gives a loud cry on the day of his birth, the Church also gave a loud cry on the day of Pentecost. And this cry manifested itself in the form of tongues. The tongues of all the visitors who had come to Jerusalem for the pilgrimage. In one instance, the church was spread across the world. Because all these people who had come from different parts of the world could hear the apostles speak in their own native language. Again, just as a baby that is born is no longer hidden in the womb of his mother, on the day of Pentecost, the church was no longer hidden. It came out boldly and began to proclaim the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. Today is a day of celebration, first of all, and it's also a day of prayer. We pray that just as the Holy Spirit came down mightily upon the apostles, that the Holy Spirit may come down mightily upon us to transform our lives and make us instruments of God's salvation to the ends of the earth. There are several lessons that we must learn today from our readings. Lesson number one, God is a promise keeper. God never promises and fails. Whatever God has promised, he must surely bring to pass. In fact, as we can see in our gospel passage today, Jesus promised the apostles, the counselor, the advocate. And this promise is exactly fulfilled in our first reading when the Holy Spirit actually came down upon the apostles. Dear friends, we can greatly and completely rely on the promises of God because God never fails. In fact, looking at our gospel passage today, Jesus Christ made a promise there that anyone who loves him and keeps his commandment, that the Father will love him too. And we, that is, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, we come upon him and make our own in him. In other words, it is a promise and it's one that we can rely upon. If we keep God's commandments, if we love God, we become living tabernacles. God himself comes to dwell in our hearts. Lesson number two. There are several spirits, but only one Holy Spirit. We live in a spiritual world. There is more to reality than what meets the physical eyes. Even as humans, we are not only physical bodies, we are also spiritual beings. What we do or refuse to do is often a direct product of the kind of spirit that is in charge of our lives. So one could be possessed by demonic spirits, 
one could be possessed by foul spirits one could be possessed by the spirit of greed one could be possessed by the spirit of robbery and kidnapping one could also be possessed by the spirit of immorality which according to St. Paul's is living in the flesh. When we have the Spirit of God in us, St. Paul says, that Spirit of God, which is the Holy Spirit, helps us to put to death the deeds of the flesh. As we read in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 24, these fruits will begin to manifest in our lives. Love, joy, peace, kindness gentleness patience self-control goodness faithfulness against such support says there is no law and those who belong to christ have crucified the flesh with its passions so we cannot say that we have the holy spirit in us and yet we continue to live in sin when we have the Holy Spirit, all these evil things will be a thing of the past. Immorality, living according to the flesh, will be a thing of the past. And these fruits will begin to manifest in our lives. Lesson three. The Holy Spirit decides which particular gift is necessary for the common good. As we saw in today's first reading, when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, it manifested itself in the form of tongues. This was the particular gift that was necessary at that point in time because the word about Jesus needed to spread immediately across the world. So we should not think that speaking in tongues is the only gift of the Holy Spirit Neither is it the most important gift of the Holy Spirit. And we should not assume that one who does not speak in tongues does not have the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 to 11, St. Paul clarifies this issue. He says, to each is given the manifestation of the Holy Spirit for the common good. To one is given the utterance of wisdom. To another is given the utterance of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another is given the gift of faith. To another the gift of working miracles. To another the gift of prophecy. To another the gift of tongues. To another the gift of interpreting tongues. To another the gift of healing. To another is given the, the gift of of distinguishing between spirits so and the holy spirit is the one who decides which gift is appropriate for each person first corinthians chapter 12 verse 7 to 11. so you see all we need to do is to pray for the holy spirit and the holy spirit himself is the one who would decide which particular gift is necessary for us we must avoid the temptation of speaking in gibberish all because we want to give people the impression that we have the holy spirit i am more convinced of the presence of the holy spirit in a repentant christian than in one who simply speaks in tongues lesson number four what is the meaning of holy ghost fire most often when we mention holy ghost fire we always mention it in the context of praying against our enemies praying that the holy ghost fire should burn our enemies and it is always exciting it is it is it is exciting to imagine that your enemies are burning in fire but let us face the truth first of all the word ghosts is a poor translation of spirits they are not the same thing ghosts is an appearance of someone already dead 
a, an imagination, so to say, something that is unreal. Even Jesus Christ was not comfortable when the disciples imagined him to be a ghost. And he said to them, I am not a ghost. Do you have something there to eat? And they gave him fish. They gave him bread. He ate and he drank water to prove to them that he is not a ghost. So when we are referring to God as the third person in the Trinity as a ghost, I wonder, is God dead? Is God simply an imagination or an appearance? No. If Jesus Christ would not allow the disciples to refer to him as a ghost, then God is not a ghost. So we should not call the Holy Spirit Holy Ghost. Spirits and ghosts are not the same thing. So there is no such thing as Holy Ghost fire. Rather, we should speak of Holy Spirit fire. In our first reading again, we saw that fire descended upon the heads of the apostles. Now I ask, did the fire burn the apostles? No. Was the fire a weapon? No. The fire rather marked them out as persons who have been chosen by God. The fire was a blessing upon them. So this idea of calling down Holy Ghost fire upon our enemies is not even a Christian idea. Because Christ told us to pray for our persecutors, to love our enemies. Christ told us to forgive in the, in the Lord's prayer. If we do not forgive those who have sinned against us, God will not forgive our sins. And this phenomenon of calling down Holy Ghost fire comes from the Old Testament. In Numbers chapter 16, where God sent down fire to consume 250 men who were conspirators with Jotan, Dotan, and Abiram, who were those who led the revolutions in the book of Numbers. And this fire came at God's instance. Nobody prayed for it. So some people have now taken this Old Testament concept, mixed it up with the New Testament, and they now believe that Holy Spirit fire is a weapon. It is not a weapon. In fact, we should pray for the Holy Spirit fire. Because it is a fire that purifies us. It is a fire that washes us away from our carnal desires and our attachment to sin. It is a good fire. When we pray the come Holy Spirit, we say, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful and enkindle in us the fire of your love. We need that fire. Holy Spirit fire is not a weapon for our enemies. Rather, it is a must have for every Christian. We need the fire of the Holy Spirit so as to be able to put to death the deeds of the flesh that are in us. As St. Paul would advise Timothy to fire into flames the spirit that he has received on the day of his ordination. We need the Holy Spirit fire to fan into flames the spirit that we receive on the day of our baptism and on the day of our confirmation when the bishop laid hands on us. In summary, my dear friends in Christ, the four lessons that we learned today. Number one, God is a promise keeper. God never fails in his word. Secondly, there are different kinds of spirits that can possess us, but we should strive to be possessed by the Holy Spirit so as to manifest the fruits of the Spirit. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit is the one who decides which particular gift we should have. We should not begin to speak in gibberish or in the name of speaking in tongues, because speaking in tongues is one out of the many gifts of the Holy Spirit. And finally, there is no such thing as Holy Ghost fire. Rather, we have Holy Spirit fire. And it is not a weapon for our enemies. It is rather something that we need in our lives in order to be good Christians. 
May God bless His rights in our hearts. Amen.